Hi, I'm Jerry Carita. I am the writer and creator of The Grizzly Crew, Takeda Samurai, and the publisher of Reign of Dracula, and Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom. You can find me and all my comic book stuff at Thorny Comics on Instagram and on X or on Facebook on the only Thorny Comics, www.thornycomics.com, which will always redirect directly to whatever I'm working on at the moment. And you are watching and or listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He's a comic creator. He's also in the TV and film industry as well. So we're talking about a brand new comic that is kid-friendly, beautifully drawn, that is very colorful. We are joined by the ever-talented Jerry Carita. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Kurt. How are you? Good. I'd be very remiss if I didn't say we're talking about the Grizzly Crew. <laughs> yep, the Grizzly Crew, a, a team of pirate bears fighting evil bears out in the world. Bear on bear crime. That's so horrible in today's age. <laughs> <laughs> bear on bear crime. It's bear on, uh, and this is a bear. It's like bear on wolf and bear on like fox or coyote crime. So, <laughs> like, so that's okay. We don't mind that. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm glad there's a differentiation between yeah, the two. Huge. I'm jumping ahead of myself, though, but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. So I'm Jerry Carita. I am a reality television producer by day. Um, I worked on a lot of like History Channel, Discovery Channel, A&E, unscripted shows. People probably heard of a handful of them. And more recently, I began writing and creating and publishing my own comic books. What we're talking about today is my second one that I've created. And it's the fourth one now that I'm publishing. It's called The Grizzly Crew. It was co-created with my son about two years ago. And it's about a team of pirate bears that sail the seas, protecting villages from evil human pirates and evil other anthropomorphic animal pirates, uh, which, you know, later, later in the story. And that's the basic setup. It sounds like a fun concept. How did this concept come about? Because I, I saw briefly in the Kickstarter campaign that you kind of talked about this, but I'd love to hear it from the horse's mouth. About two years ago, I was working on a comic idea that I had about a samurai cicada, those little really noisy insects that pop out every 17 years or whatever on the cycle. There's a big brood coming out this year, actually, in the spring. I was using Mid Journey when it first came out in a really easily usable form and everyone hadn't decided yet if they hated it, if it was the beginning of the end of civilization or if it was just like a fun thing to play with. I was in my office and I was using it and I had all these like weird bug monster looking things, these like malformed monsters up on the screen. And my little six-year-old walks in and he's like, what's this, dad? And I said, it's an artificial intelligence art generator. And I just told him what it was, even though he was six. He was like, can it make a Spider-Man monkey? I was like, sure, sure, let me try that. Spider-Man monkey, popped a Spider-Man monkey up on the screen. Minion wizard, popped up a minion wizard on the screen pretty, pretty instantly. And then he asked for a pirate bear. And so I typed in a pirate bear. Mid Journey, especially when it first came out, was really bad with faces and hands for some reason. I couldn't figure out how to make faces or hands. So it made this really like deformed, silhouetted pirate monster looking thing. It was horrible. He's afraid of bears. So he was just kind of staring at it. And I thought, okay, he's having a moment. I'm going to go back to typing and doing what I was doing. So I go back to work on this other screen over here. And suddenly my little guy is like, um, dad, his name is Captain Grizzly. And I was like, what? And he's just like, his name, the bear, dad, his name is Captain Grizzly. He's the captain of a pirate ship of bears. Um, and they go looking for treasure. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's fun. That's treasure, right? And I just kept on typing, you know, kind of half half listening. And he's like, they look for treasure, but when they find the treasure, it looks like gold, but it's not gold. It's wax. And when you squeeze it, it's filled with honey. And I was like, and then I started, like, writing some of this stuff down because I thought it was, like, hilarious. And then he goes, it's called The Grizzly Crew. He named the book, like, like in the first 15 seconds of talking about this horrific thing on my screen. So then I started taking notes, and we started bouncing ideas back and forth. It very quickly became, like, a fun game I was playing with my son. And I was taking notes, and then, you know, I reached out to my buddy Nick Justice, who's an artist, and sent him all the notes and just said, can you... You know, like, what do you come up with here? And kind of talked about the cartoons that I loved growing up and all that. And he drew these characters and that most of them are exactly as they appear in the in the artwork under my name right now. That's awesome. I, I love that. And the creative mind of a child is is impressionable. And the fact that he came up with this in 15 seconds based off of a horrible 
image is is incredible. So much better at this than I am already. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> Bra- brainstorming, you know, it's like oh, yeah, I've been I've been messing around with creative in, for the past all of my life, and you just came right. up with this masterpiece. I was like brain drizzling, and he he was like, "Here's a brain superstorm." And I'm like, oh, "Damn it, come on." <laughs> Look, the apple doesn't fall from the, far from the tree, right? That that's oh, what you're you. gonna say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I taught him everything he knows. So talk about the the crew of the Grizzly Crew because I think that's they're beautiful characters. It's creative, and we'll talk about the team as well. But but who is the crew of the Grizzly Crew? The captain is Captain Grizzly. Um, he is a grizzly bear, so he's a little bit more brown than the others. There's Stefan, who's a gigantic polar bear who is grumpy all the time. This is something else my son came up with. He's grumpy all the time because he's a polar bear. Pirates always sail where it's hot, and polar bears want to be cold. So he's grouchy because he's uncomfortable and angry that it's hot all the time. The other three members of the Grizzly crew, when the, show, when the story starts, are um, the Claw family. Mama Claw, Papa Claw, and Rosie. And Rosie is based on my daughter, Yvonne whose middle name is Rose. And she's really smart and kind of wants to get off this crazy ship of pirate bears. She wants to be like an engineer, do something with her brain, build things, design stuff. But she's stuck on the ship because her mom is the first mate. Pirating is all her mom knows. And her dad is the pacifist chef. And then the first story is about um, a new member who joins the crew. His name is Jimmy. He's a koala. Tried to explain to my son, koalas are not actually bears. And right away he said, well, maybe he's young and he doesn't know that. So he just, he thinks he's a real bear and he wants to join the Grizzly crew, even though he's not really a bear. I was like, this is so good. Like, good. Yes, that sounds great. <laughs> and so that's what the story is about. This first arc that I'm working on is about how little Jimmy kind of becomes part of the team and, you know, faces off against a bunch of things that he's terrified of. How many volumes do you have planned for the Grizzly crew? Grizzly crew is right now, it's the arc I'm telling right now has five issues. Uh, that'll be the first volume. And then we'll see how it does. You know, from there, I think whether I continue to kind of this uphill battle of an all ages book that's funded on Kickstarter or not, I, I am positive based on the experiences I've had at conventions that this will do well at conventions because people show up with their kids to conventions and you walk around all day and you mostly are seeing like sexy stuff and, and things that are not necessarily kid appropriate. And there's always a kid section, but for a comic to have like this kind of art on the cover, I think it draws kids in. And I think parents will come over and go, this looks like something I would have watched when I was a kid. I want to share this with my kid. So I'm, I'm convinced it'll do well once I actually print it and I'm in, and I'm at a convention somewhere, I have a ways to go to get there. But so, and if that's the case, I'll keep, I'll keep writing it. I'll absolutely keep doing it. My son in his, like in our, in our kind of rambling conversations, he's up to volume four. <laughs> he's got like a giant you know i want there to be like a big bad and kind of a progression of the story in each volume and so you know we're he's already up to like a sea monster that they they have to get together with the bad guys and fight the sea monster you know they have to like work together and i'm like that's definitely like a three issues down the road kind of a thing three arcs down the road he's ahead of me but that's the plan right now i'm gonna do this see how it goes do another one see how it goes i'm gonna finish i'm committed personally to finishing this first arc so five issues are happening, regardless of what Kickstarter says. So what are some of the themes then of the first book? It's all about, you know, when my son was looking at that screen with the bear on it, he's afraid of bears. And so I kind of wanted to tether the whole story to that. It's about um, the things kids are afraid of and how we as parents, you know, help them work through those things. The Grizzly Crew, really, what's going on in the story is it's a bedtime story. This village that's being terrified by pirates they start telling their kids, you guys don't have to worry anymore. We hired the Grizzly crew. They're protecting the village. And even the kids are like, come on, dad, like that's not that's not a real thing. You got you're you're lying to me now, right? That's sort of what the whole story is about. So it becomes it becomes all the things that like my kids are have been afraid of over the years will be characters or themes in the book. And the Grizzly crew will help fend off those fears. Why is this an important book for for parents and for kids to read? I think it's like there's like a therapeutic thing about having fun with something you're afraid of. So like, you know, in Harry Potter, when the Bogart is in the closet and they go ridiculous and it makes you laugh at the thing you're afraid of, that's kind of what it is. You know, my son was afraid of bears. So now it's a team of bears that are the heroes. And kind of he can think of bears as something other than just something to be afraid of. By the way, please, everyone don't go near a bear. Like you should totally be afraid of a bear in the woods. But 
you know, <laughs> the villains are wolves, coyotes and other scary things. And there's a sea monster at some point. People are afraid of water and deep water and stuff like that. So it's all going to be kind of based on things that humans and especially kids are afraid of at the beginning. And it'll, you know, it's not meant as therapy, but I think it's nice to laugh at something that you're scared of and kind of be able to, you know, champion it that way. Who is the team around the Grizzly Crew? Okay, so my son and I are co-creating it. I'm writing. Nick Justice is the artist and character designer. He is doing all the interiors, and he did one of the covers for this for this issue. Uh, the colorist is a, a guy named Nathan Lawson, who is fantastic. And I don't have a letterer yet on board. I haven't. We haven't done that part yet of the book. Um, we're still we're in colors now. The other two covers were by a guy named Len Danovich, who I met through Nick. Len's a fantastic, talented artist. He did my black and white cover for the more discerning collector. The other cover is Pablo Verdugo, who's a cover artist and interior artist. I believe he's in Argentina. And I met him when I was doing another book uh, as a publisher called the uh, Billy the Kid. That's the whole team. The Kickstarter campaign is currently ongoing. When does it end? It ends February 28th. I actually made a mistake when I set it up. So I had, I was setting up the backer kit and the Kickstarter at the same time. And at some point I slid the start of the campaign by a week. I slid the end of it on backer kit, but I must've forgotten to do it on Kickstarter. So when I hit go, I realized suddenly I only had 20 days to hit my goal. So now I'm, I'm at, I have nine days left as of this recording. So I'm, you know, whenever you're listening to this, I don't know, but go check it out. It might be only a couple of hours left at that point. <laughs> Inspirations are always a fun aspect when it comes to creating these comics. And we touched on it in the green room a little bit here, but what are some of the inspirations for this particular comic series? When I first sent Nick the idea, the first thing I asked him to do was just draw Captain Grizzly. And I didn't really give him a lot of like, you know, notes about it. I said it was for my, my little, my youngest boy. And so he drew a character that was very kind of childlike like not not the character was a child but it would have been really at home in a board book story you know for you know toddlers yeah. um and it was beautiful but it was very kind of soft and you know very not scary and not and the, not the star of an action adventure so the creative like the touchstones we talked about after that were jungle book and all these cartoons that i used to love when i was a kid all the ones with the earworm theme songs so gummy bears and tailspin oh you you know all those things um and i said you know i think they should look like this it's a bear it's clearly a bear it's anthropomorphic but it doesn't have like human fingers and things like that you know it's a little bit more bear-like and animal-like and everything else in the world these bears live in is a human as far as they know, they're the only anthropomorphic things floating around, at least at the beginning of the story. But I wanted them to look and be the size of, I didn't want them all to be human size, but different color fur. I wanted them to be kind of like a giant bear, a bigger polar bear, the koala is much smaller than everybody else. So those were the creative touchstones. It was the cartoons I used to watch as a kid. Out of those inspirations, which character most represents you? The Claw family is the one that are the ones that my son most closely based on us. So Rosie is my daughter. So the chef who doesn't like to fight, that's me, which is funny too. It's all kind of like mixed and mingled. My father-in-law is a chef. His name is Stefan and the polar bear's name is Stefan, but Stefan is also my son, Gerard, the older son, his middle name. The polar bear is supposed to be based on my son, but it's got the name of my father-in-law. It's all very intermingled because of stuff like that. The first mate, Mama Claw, who's the smallest of the black bear family, like she's physically, you know, diminutive, is also the fiercest fighter because you don't ever want to mess with a mama bear. That's how that works. Based on like Jungle Book and Tailspin and all those characters, oh. which one most represents you? Oh, wow. Good Lord. Characters from all those shows? That is tough. I mean, I'd like to say Baloo always. <laughs> I'd like to say always Baloo. Like I like to try and have fun, but I probably am grumpy. That's the nice thing about stories like that is they all kind of represent different facets of your your personality. And if you're, if you're writing a good story, even the villain has a little bit of you in them. Is, is there a bit of Shere Khan? I mean, from Tailspin, I'd like his money. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. Uncle Louie and Tailspin is a lot more fun than the one in the original Jungle Book story. But I'd like to think all of them have small aspects of, you know, you can see yourself in all those characters, which is kind of why I love them, you know, depending on what kind of mood you're in, you can ident identify with. Scrooge McDuck's money would be, would be a nice touch as well, too. That'd be... Oh, yeah. Just swimming. I'd oh, like yeah. the magical ability to swim through coins. That's what I'd like. <laughs> just to break out at parties, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just, that's right. Just dive in from like way on high directly into a pile of coins. I love it. 
based on, of course, your collaboration with not only your, your son, but also with Nick Justice, bringing Grizzly Crew to life, is there a standout moment where you got the art and you were like, wow, this just is way better than I expected? It was the second round. So the first character, I have a beautiful, it's 11 by 17, big original Captain Grizzly that I really, I really liked more like a board book. It wasn't a comic book action hero character. When he sent back the, the second round of characters, um, which I can share with you, he, they were, they were amazing. They were like, they were hilarious. They were funny. They were um, sometimes they, you could see how they would be scary. You know, when you want to kind of turn that, like touch on that theme about how these bears actually can be terrifying. Um, you know, so it was probably then it was, it was when I got the first round of pencils, the pencils of those characters. And he sent them all at one time too, which was kind of cool. Like he just kind of cycled through like eight characters and sent them all to me at once. And I was like, these are all pretty awesome. Um, my son had notes, but you know, I was like right away, like, these are great. He started watching these YouTube videos about and bears and stuff. So when we got, when we got back the pencils, he right away, he just, for some reason, Jimmy had a feather in his hat. My son hated that. I have no idea why, but he was like, I don't like the feather. I'm like, all right, I'll give him a note. No feather. But then he said his hands and feet don't look right. And I was like, what? And he said, koalas, their feet are more like hands. Like they can grip things, you know? And that's why he's a good climber, dad. He's going to climb into the thing on the top of the, on the top of the flag on the ship. And I was like, oh, he's already got in his head that, the koala is a good climber and this character doesn't look enough like a climber. And I was like, okay, great. So I gave that note. But then the other one was, I had no, I didn't know this. And my son, I learned this about koalas. I was 42 years old when I learned that from my seven year, then seven year old son, that koalas have two opposable digits. They have two thumbs. I had no idea. He was like, he needs another thumb. And I was like, well, he's got two hands. He's got one on each hand. He said, no, no, no. On one hand, they have two thumbs on one hand. Dad. And I didn't believe him. And I looked it up and he was right. So if you look at a koala bear, they can grip things really well and climb and stuff because they have two opposable digits. They have, I think it's five fingers, three on one side and two going in the other direction. And I was like, amazing. So I, Nick had to draw in a second thumb on all these little characters he had drawn. You need that now, the more you know. Yeah. <laughs> Rainbow. Yeah, I was a living today, I learned me. Uh, Blue Juice no. Comics, that's the publishing blue juice is a group of my friends who uh i know through television I, I worked with two of them one of them had been an audio mixer he's now a production manager and line producer and the other one is uh, a cinematographer and I, I worked with the two of them on comic book men they had already formed a company where they were you know stockpiling money to make their own short films music videos their own like content this is this is 12 years ago before everybody called it content you know, before it was all just content. On the set, we were talking and they all, and we all had all these ideas for these gigantic time travel, epic fantasy stories. And we were like, well, look, I mean, you know, Comic Book Men is very nice, but no one's giving a bunch of people from Comic Book Men $200 million to make a, a time travel epic. You know, one of the guys, Ronnie Porto, who was the assistant camera operator on the show, he had a specific idea. And the Blue Juice guys decided we're going to spin off into a comic book company. We're going to use all these people that we're meeting through 10 years almost of working on comic book men, 96 episodes of that show, and make connections and and learn how this part of the business works. And we're going to turn these into comic books. And then we can, you know, this is when The Walking Dead had just come out as a TV series. And so everybody, I think, was like, I'm going to draw a comic book and turn it into a TV show and make a million dollars. You know, they quickly fell in love with the genre of comic books. Um, and producing them and writing them and publishing them. They had a couple of hit hit books in stores. The Accelerators did pretty well. And Bonnie, which is another comic book about uh, pirates. And then more recently, they do a, a book called uh, Billy the Kit, which was something they picked up from Justin Gray from uh, Kickstarter, actually. We found it on Kickstarter. You know, those guys started that company. And, you know, eight years, nine years later, during the pandemic, I started working with them, kind of doing conventions and just kind of learning how the publishing side of it worked. And now and I started my own thing. So what have you learned then based off of that wonderful experience and collaboration with that company to put it towards the Grizzly crew? The first thing is that nobody doing this, at least not the way I'm doing it, nobody doing this gets rich doing it. They used to joke that making comics and publishing comics is the art of spending thousands to make hundreds. That's pretty accurate. It, it costs money to go to a convention. You often, unless you're a very big entity, you don't make back that money in what you're selling. You kind of are lucky to break even. It's not about it's not about making the profit. So it's all about um, you know making connections with other other people and kind of building an audience of people who are interested in your thing. And if you do that consistently for a long time, you can build a pretty dedicated following of people who just like what you're doing. 
And I think that the big thing is that I learned from them and from other people, you know, taken advice from over the last couple of years is basically if there's a book that you like the idea of and you don't, you can't find it on the shelves, you should just make that book. You can, if you're a creative person and you have the discipline to sit down and write, you can just sit down and make that book. Yeah. The, the ability and the flexibility, because there are no original stories, it's all about taking an original story and making your own twist. Pretty much how the zombie genre spawned from Night of the Living Dead or Day of the Living Dead and, you know, Walking Dead basically spawned a whole other generation of, of zombie horror, horror comics. Do you know who, um, do you know John Cameron Mitchell? You know who that is? So he was Hedwig. He created Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which was a Tony winning Broadway show. I think 15 years before that, it was an off, off, off Broadway rock show. It's about a, it's so, this is so weirdly off topic for a conversation about a kid's book, but like, it's just, I'm going to tell you anyway. It's about um, a trans, a sort of transsexual, transvestite character in communist East Berlin. So weird. I'm not going to get into all the details, but he ends up in America. It's a weird like rock and roll story. It's got amazing music, like based on like Plato's Symposium and the gods splitting us in half. And we're all just looking for our other half for the rest of our lives and, and things like that. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful thing. And it won a bunch of Tonys a few years ago on Broadway eventually. Um, I think Neil Patrick Harris won a Tony for playing the character. And John Cameron Mitchell is the creator. He played, the, he originated the character. He, he created the whole story and a lot of the music. And he said something in an interview that always stuck with me. And it was, if you just take a couple of things that you really like and you smash them together in a way that might not make sense to other people, you'll eventually come up with something that's original and clever and a fun spin on both of those other things. So I think that story was about, you know, a person trying to find his other half and like, it's a, kind of a romantic comedy in a lot of ways. It's a lot sadder than one, but it's kind of a romantic comedy. And he loved all this like androgynous seventies glam rock. And he kind of just brought these things together and he loved like musical theater and he just jammed all these things together into a truly unique thing but if you break down the parts of it it's like you said you know there aren't original stories you can you take the stories that have existed for thousands of years that are all about the human experience and you kind of jam something new into them um, and you come up with something new and cool and hopefully like interesting to other people we're only here for a limited amount of time, so we have to be as creative as possible if that's our profession, or we just fall into being a creative right. person for our, for our profession. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, that's a good one. I would say it was in college. When I was in college, I was on the school newspaper. Every year, we put out an April Fool's issue, and it would always be these jokes that were based on stories we had actually published or things that had happened on campus and stuff like that. And every year, we got in trouble for the april fool's issue because invariably somebody would take it seriously and someone would would think that we were you know especially when you're trying to be funny some people don't what you say once it's out in the world it falls on other people's ears differently than how you intended it regardless of what you intended people find it offensive or aggravating or they don't, they don't think you're funny which can bother you so you know and that's all words that's all just words on a page back in college it was like we did a a couple of goofy stories and we had a nun come down to the office one time and just was really really a very old woman god love her and she just came into the production office and was just yelling at us she was so upset about some jokes you know that were not even off that off color they were some of them were off color but they weren't that bad they weren't that bad but she was very upset you know i think that's when i first was like oh wow like when you put something out in the world you know it actually has power and some people will get really upset you have the power to change people's like mood for the day you can ruin someone's day you know by just writing the wrong thing or writing it indelicately just the way something that's not indelicate and totally fine just falls on someone else's ears yeah words hurt sticks and stones the whole bit like it has yeah. a kind of truth to it yeah, and you've got to kind of be careful, but also you, you you know you can't really censor yourself. I write these things for myself, but I also am writing them to be consumed by other people, and so I want it to be consumed the way that I intended it, not misconstrued. And you know, I don't want to ruin someone's day with it. I want to have them have an experience that I had when I was creating. You know, uh, and you can't control that, so you can kind of do your best to tell the story in a way that kind of guides people on the journey you want to take them on but you can't guarantee it. And so occasionally someone's going to come to you and be like, this part sucked. Or, you know, I was really mad when this happened, or I can't believe you had to bear say this. It's totally inappropriate. And like, I, you know, you, you can't control all of that. Um, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have all that in my head while I was 
writing. But you you know you do have to be careful though. Because you you're in the the film and TV industry and, and you're in comics, you're basically in the epitome of what geek culture is and pop culture is right now. So looking at those industries that you are currently in, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice yeah. that you've received that has stuck with you <laughs> in your career? Yeah, I had a good I had a good answer for number one. Number two is probably, I think number one was that thing about mashing things together and coming up with something original. I would say number two is there's sort of like an, an, an underlying thing here. You, it's all work. You know, you, you ultimately, you have to sit down, you have to have discipline. You have to like, you have to do your homework. You, have, you can't be writing a comic book or writing anything or producing a TV show if you're not sitting somewhere focusing on the thing and the task at hand and crafting it into something that's good. And it's a lot of work. And sometimes it doesn't go anywhere and it's a labor of love and you're not making any money doing it, especially if you're doing it right. Sometimes it's a long time before you are successful. And so very early on when I was a production assistant, someone, I asked someone a very broad question and I was like, what's, what's some advice for somebody like me getting into the, TV, the film industry? And he was like, can you imagine yourself happy doing anything else? Literally anything else. If you decided to become an architect, that's creative. That can be a creative endeavor, but you wouldn't be doing this. Would you be happy doing that? And I thought about it for a long time. He's like, because if you can think of, if you can imagine being happy doing something else, you should do the other thing because this is frustrating. Being creative and like trying to make something that you want to convince someone else is good. That's a really hard thing to do. And you're kind of putting yourself out there, exposing yourself to a lot of criticism and, and all that. And he was like, it's not worth it unless it's the only thing you can imagine yourself doing. And then do it by all means and do it wholeheartedly. But if you can think of yourself happy doing anything else, you should do the, you should definitely just do the other thing. And this can be like a hobby. You can do this on the side or go to the movies and get your fix that way. You know what I mean? That was good advice. Yeah, that, that definitely is good advice. <laughs> I just wish I would have found that heard that earlier in my own careers when I decided to, because I loved IT, but then I was like, I got burnt out. You get burnt out with something that you're really passionate about sometimes and you just need a, a shift of focus or a shift of scene. And it just completely changes your outlook on, you know, I never expected myself to be a creative person. Like, right. That was not on my, my wheelhouse. <laughs> Yeah. My, my thing now is like television is a weird, it's weird in TV right now. You know, Netflix kind of came along and swallowed the movies and swallowed TV and, and then all the other um, companies consolidated and created their own streamers. And, you know, everything that isn't, isn't owned by Disney is owned by like Warner brothers. Now it's a weird time to be making television. It's all now about checking boxes and content. It feels less creative and, and, and less fun in some ways. Um, I still have a great time doing it. I love the people I work with. I love the networks I work with and stuff. But, you know, it it is just a weirder kind of, it's less fun. It might just be that I'm also getting old. So that's part of what I love about the comic thing is I can do whatever I want. I can write whatever I want. If I can find a hundred people on Kickstarter who vaguely like the thing that I did, I can keep doing it. And someone else will help me pay for it. It's also a lot of work and I'm working very hard at it. I'm a publisher in and of myself. You know, I'm doing all that work myself. It's fun. And it's like, telling stories I feel like telling just because I feel like telling them, which is nice. So it's a, it's a nice balance doing both things. We'll talk about the Kickstarter campaign. Is this your first Kickstarter campaign or have you done others in the past? So this is, I'm running two simultaneously right now. And this is, and this is, and this is actually my fourth and fifth ones. I ran one for Blue Juice. The first one I did, I was working with Blue Juice and we did one for Billy the Kid for their second volume of stories. We're calling it season two of Billy mm -hmm. the Kid. And so we did one for the first issue um, that had been a Kickstarter project already. So we thought this already has a following in the Kickstarter comics community. Let's start here. So I ran that campaign with Blue Juice. I was really the one spearheading that part of it. And then after that, I did my own Cicada Samurai, which funded. And I did um, another book that I did not write. I have two Kickstarter setups. One is for things that I personally create and another is for comics that I'm publishing with friends and or projects that I'm not necessarily the writer on. So I'm functioning solely as the publisher or editor and publisher on those ones. And so the second one was Reign of Dracula, which was written by Rich Davis. Um, it's sort of a continuation of his Cult of Dracula and Rise of Dracula, which were both indie hits over the last couple of years. And the artist is uh, Les Linden Garner, 
who's an incredibly multi-talented guy. So I ran three campaigns before this one. Do you sleep? Not much. Not much, <laughs> my friend. Not nearly enough. I went to bed last night because I knew we were talking early this morning. And <laughs> But for the most part, not not nearly enough. You know, Kickstarter is obviously, you know, very well that they're like a second, third, fourth, fifth job because you're doing multiple at this point. <laughs> when it comes to this campaign, what have you learned from past campaigns that you're trying to implement for the Grizzly crew? And what are some of the perks we have as well? So I'm, lear I'm learning that there are some things that just perform better on Kickstarter than other things. And, you know, this is an all ages story. It's very kid friendly. And when you look at it, I think it, it screams like this is a, this is a possibly a cartoon later. This is a kid series. Like this is the kind of thing you'd see on the shelf. I was definitely going for like a very mainstream look. And that's not necessarily what the Kickstarter crowd is always looking for. They're looking for more indie things that you can't really find in stores and stuff like that. So I'm learning that in real time right now. And the other stuff I've learned is just this, keeping it simple. You know, I had a campaign that was very complicated, um, still dealing with fulfilling it. And it was like we had 28 covers and it's just too many things. We were nervous about it. So we kept adding layers to it after the campaign had started. And when you do that, it gets very tricky. It gets very hard to fulfill. Kickstarter is like, it's not a transaction directly from one person buying you your comic. So you can't cater to each individual person. It has to be kind of an automated system that works. And so if you keep adding layers to it, it gets confusing to the couple of hundred people that look at your campaign. And then you end up just doing customer service like all day, every day, which is also part of the game. I get it. But for Billy the Kit and Cicada Samurai, the first two campaigns I ran, I kept them a little bit more simple. I preferred that. And so for this, I, I'm keeping it pretty simple. So this is the campaign. It's um, I'm right now, I'm at 77 backers. I have nine days left at recording. Again, when this when you see this, I, I, please go check it out because I might be a few days left. I basically kept it pretty simple. I wanted to make it really easy for people to decide what they wanted. It's it's not a foil, you know, collectible with multiple 15 covers. I have three cover options. One of the first images of the Grizzly crew that Nick, these are kind of like the original characters that Nick drew. So this is how they came to me. And they're pretty cool. This is Papa Claw, Mama Claw, Captain Grizzly in the back, Rosie, Jimmy the Koala, Stefan the Polar Bear. And these are two of my villains over here. All the villains are based on canines. So there are foxes and coyotes and Captain Wolfheart is this big guy kind of looming in the background here. I kind of, you know, based on like an old, uh, Indiana Jones or Star Wars, like a Drew Struzan poster, you know, with yeah. like, there's always some gigantic shadowy figure in the background. Um, that was kind of the idea. And then these are the covers. This is the one Nick Justice drew. So this is Captain Wolfheart down here. And this is what I love. I don't know if I, when I zoom in, if you see it zoomed in, yeah, I see it. but he's, he's terrifying. You know, the original Captain Grizzly drawing was, he looked like Wiley e. Coyote. This guy up here was the original Captain Grizzly, this guy oh. down here. My son who watches a lot of Looney Tunes was like, no, 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 he's too funny. He needs to be scary. So we redrew him. We had him redrawn as sort of a Captain Hook Commodore mm -hmm. kind of figure. So this one's by Nick Justice. I love this cover. And this is this is the one that sort of matches the inside art the most. And then this is by Pablo Verdugo. I met Pablo. He did a cover for Billy the Kid, which I loved. This is the one that everyone's like, that looks like a Saturday morning cartoon. That just <laughs> looks like that could be on TV right now. Yeah. And I'm like, cool. I hope someone I hope someone agrees. And this is Len Len's cover. Len Len focused more on Rosie. You've got the big young bear. She's only supposed to be a 10-year-old, but she's huge because she's a bear. And he's a koala in the background. But that's Rosie, my really smart little girl. And these are some interior pages. So like I said, we're in colors now. So some of these are black and white. The story begins, there are real pirates terrorizing a village. And so this is the thing. This is the real pirates. And I wanted it to be scary. So, you know, I asked Nick, like, draw, draw these pirates to be actually kind of terrifying. And so he did. They're very inky and dark and shadowy and scary. And everything is being lit by the fires they set in the village, you know? And then that night, the kids can't sleep. You know, dad comes in and is initially just like, go to bed, <laughs> which is, this is a scene that plays out in my house almost every night right there. But, you know, then he realizes pretty quickly they're really scared. So he'll start telling them a story. And he's like, have you guys ever heard of the Grizzly crew? And, you know, you can tell right away they're not buying it. They're <laughs> like, dad, come on. Like, this is this is nonsense. So this is the first time we see the team in the in the book. It's a few pages in. And then these are the art commissions you can get. You can get full color. What's nice is um I put this up and then like a day later they announced they're bringing Space Ghost back. And there oh, he nice. is right there. Nick is a great artist and he does all these kinds of styles and lots of cartoon and, and comic book characters and stuff like that. So any character you want, you can get as an add-on as a as a five by eight color or black and white. Or these are the 11 by 17 ones, which is like the full, you know, artboard size. 
and the black and whites are very cool and you know shady and these are just awesome i'm just i'm very i'm very excited about seeing what he comes up with for these beautiful um you could also buy the cover his uh his original artboard cover it's a one of one it's the only copy and then uh down here this is cicada samurai which is my original my original comic so it's available as an add-on as well and this is the whole backstory which we've already talked about but the covers are it's pretty straightforward the rewards are very straightforward it's you know you can get one copy you can get a digital copy all the rewards that are physical come with the digital copy you know you can get nick's cover as a trade you can get pablo's cover as a trade len's cover um you can get well, any version cover you want you can choose two covers as a, and you get a deal you can choose two virgin covers and you get a deal and then there's like if you want all three trade covers if you want all three virgin covers and then if you want i have two retailer tiers which i worked really hard at this i always slap retailer tiers in there and i always hear from retailers that are like that's just not how our business works these are too expensive so my retailer tiers are steeply steeply discounted like a 55 percent discount so if you're a retailer and you want 10 copies of the book, you get them for less than half of what I'm charging for them. That's the idea. And then there's another tier where you can get 20 of them. And this is in all the, all the covers. And that's pretty much it. All the covers, the second retailer tier, the, our early bird deals are all gone. But that's it. It's very straightforward. It's a matter of which covers do you want? How many copies do you want? That's it. Try to keep it really simple. Is there anything I haven't touched on you'd like to like me to ask you? No, I mean, I'm in I'm in the, like Scott Snyder's writing class. And, nice. okay. you know, like the other people I've talked to is um, J James Tynan is my cousin. So I talked to him a lot. So uh, all that news that came out this week about his production thing, like I've been hearing about that since Thanksgiving, you know, um, <laughs> those have both been influences on me in, in different ways. We've had the Tales from the Cloakroom volume one and two on the show as well. So that was great. A great oh, experience, great. great conversation. So if I could just put Scott's name at the top of the Grizzly crew, I think I'd be there already, but oh, here yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, what you need to do is get Scott Snyder to do a quick forward of your book. Yeah, that's true. He isn't yeah. up on his plate these days. Yeah. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? It was probably my cousin. My cousin is James Tynan. Um, and right around the time I was working on Comic Book Men is when he started working at DC Comics, writing, you know, backstories for Batman and eventually Batman. I wasn't really a comics reader until I was in my 30s because I was working on Comic Book Men. We were in a shop and The Walking Dead is the first comic I read. So you know, it's sort of like a dual thing. It's like Kevin Smith, Robert Kirkman, and James Tynan. It's all, all not even dual, but triple. All three of those people. That's a pretty good Mount Rushmore right there. That's that's <laughs> not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> okay, then who's your fourth on Mount Rushmore for this industry? Right now, it's definitely Scott Snyder. So Scott does a, a, a writing workshop and class through his Substack, um, Our Best Jacket, it's called. Jacket with two Ts. I joined that class two years ago when I first started writing. And just to kind of hear someone talking, he loves to talk about the craft, the process, and how to build an arc. And, you know, he's kind of famous for drawing all these little mini arcs that build up to a bigger arc. So he's got all these like stegosaurus looking things in his office apparently. And so just hearing someone kind of talk about the actual logistical part of the craft of writing a story. What I've learned is that a story is a story is a story is a story. All the same things I do when I'm, you know, working in post-production on a reality show or all the things I heard in my screenwriting classes or when I'm writing for television, they're the same kinds of bits and bobs. And it's just a matter of applying them to a different medium and how you kind of get those little bits and pieces across. And, you know, where in television, you have the act breaks, you know, before commercials, you have to have a cliffhanger. In comics, you have the page turn moments that make you flip to the next page. They all have these little rules and these little things to think about that you don't necessarily think about if you're just telling a story. And so that's been fascinating. And Scott just loves just talking about that stuff, you know? So that, that's that been a really big influence on me in the last two years. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful reality show creator as well as a comic book creator in, and publisher as professionally you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Oh, no, not yet. I, you know, I got into television because I love scripted storytelling. I love episodic and now kind of issue-based. It's very similar in comics in that way. That's what I always loved. I used to love Star Trek TV shows as a kid, Buffy the Vampire Slayer all through high school. Those are my jam. And so I, I still haven't really worked on a show that I would be excited to sit down and watch myself. 
you know, I haven't, well, I haven't done like my own must see TV. I think that I'll feel like I'm successful in television when I've done that. And in comics, I've been very lucky that I've had some people giving me great advice and this Kickstarter thing is, it came along right at the time when I wanted to start doing this. And so there's a, such a like supportive community there. I think I will feel successful at it when I've finished a full story. Like right now I have issues that are, you know, all part of these mini series. When I've successfully funded a whole mini series and then I'm sitting at a convention somewhere, you know, a couple of years from now with books that I wrote and people are interested in them and buying them. I think that'll be the moment where I'm like, I'll feel like I made it. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh man. That's brutal. So I would say I, I fight against them a lot. I fight harder against them. I feel like, I mean, I guess it depends on how you, how you define failure. Like if I'm sitting and I'm writing and I can't crack a story, I feel like a big idiot for a while and I, I'll bounce it off of other people. And, and ultimately you get there, you know, you get to something that you're happy putting out in the world. Um, if you're lucky, sometimes you don't. But failure for this, you know, would be like not funding the project. If this doesn't get funded, I would probably finish the book anyway, go out of pocket for it, and then come back with a slightly different campaign, just try something new. So I think, I think the answer is um, I try to attack the problem from a different angle. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation co-creating with you is an inspiring story in itself. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, see, this is something that I don't know if anyone really has an answer to, because you don't know. You know, like when we were kids, I think the kids who read comics and were into these, like, you know, geeky TV shows were were dorks. Like, it wasn't cool. And now all of those things are the biggest, like Star Wars and, you know, Marvel and Batman are the biggest movies in the world every year so it's hard to know like i don't i don't i'm not in touch enough with like my my 12 year old and my 10 year old and my eight year old i don't know what their really geeky friends are into because those are the kids who are going to grow up and turn that thing into mainstream pop culture so it's it's hard to it's i, I it's an, honestly it's, i feel like that's the hardest question it's an impossible because no one knows you can't tell i still don't understand things like twitch or why everybody is streaming all the time. I don't get it. <laughs> like they're all, my son watches other kids play video games for hours. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But that's a huge thing now. And it's it's like accepted and kind of cool. You know, everyone like it's, it, when I was a kid, the, the kid who was on like, on, on like rushed home to get on AOL Instant Messenger, you know, to go into like chat rooms, like that was the dorky kid that we were like, what is that loser doing? Let's go play basketball. You know, like that's that's kind of, that's kind of how it was when we were kids. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to, it's really an impossible question because it's always going to be the thing you don't expect because those are the kids who become creative to kind of work through the fact that they were nerdy kids. And then they grow up and they become Steven Spielberg or JJ Abrams or, you know, like Kevin Feige or whoever, like they become those people because of being a dorky kid who's really excited and into and dedicated to a thing that other people don't understand. And then they grow up and they go, we're going to make everybody understand. And then, and then we get the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know, because of that. Or we get Buffy or Highlander or, you know, Angel, et cetera. Like, I mean, yeah. I, you know, the good shows. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now the question is, can you remember your ICQ number? I don't even know what that is. Oh, wow. No, so I'm a geek. There you, you can tell. But AOL and ICQ were kind of, were instant messengers. Oh, oh, see, I never did ICQ. Uh, no. I had, um, my mom was a little bit more restrictive. Like all uh, my friends were watching The Simpsons and I wasn't quite allowed to watch The Simpsons and stuff like that because she thought Bart was a little too mouthy. Like in, in retrospect, eat my shorts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. like, but that was a bad influence. So I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to watch that. I wasn't really on AOL until I was almost in high school and it was already AOL Instant Messenger. Mm -hmm. And so I had that account and I'm still the, the nickname I made up for AOL and some messenger is still like a thing I use across a lot of social media. And so Same. if your life was a TV show, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? That is a hard one. The soundtrack would probably be um, like nineties rock 
in retrospect, I, I got like later, I got really into, you know, like Soundgarden and like other anything, basically anything. Chris, anytime Chris Cornell was in front of a microphone, I was I was there for it. You know, um, I did. I saw Audio Slave live like four times, but it wasn't until he was in Audio Slave that I was into all the other stuff he had done. Yeah. You know, so I was always a little behind on that stuff. I don't know what it would be called. That is a that is a tough on the spot question, my friend. I don't know. Probably something having to do with the kids. I mean, maybe I would just call it the Grizzly Crew, a family that makes comics and it's sort of how the comics are, their lives are about the comics and comics are about their lives. So for now, let's call it the Grizzly Crew. Good stuff. I like it. That's a tough question. Yeah. It's the fun question. It's the last question of the interview. So just to, to wrap things up here, and unfortunately, Jerry, I do hate to say it, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you survived, so that's a good thing. <laughs> barely, barely at the end there, yeah. <laughs> and it just so happens to match your Grizzly Crew theme, so barely it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. For those that want to support you and, of course, support the campaign and anything that you create or produce, tell us where we can find you on this wonderful world of the internet. All of my social media stuff is at Thorny Comics, so Thorny Comics is my Instagram handle and my Twitter handle. I'm on Instagram more than Twitter. Oh, X, sorry, X. Facebook.com slash Thorny Comics is another big one that I use. And I have a website, thornycomics.com, that always redirects to whatever campaign I'm running at the time. So right now, if you go to thornycomics.com, it goes directly to my Grizzly Crew Kickstarter campaign. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T W O website is going through a revamp so actually go to our youtube channel because that's always updated because i'm only one person give me a break it's youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast is back at two geeks talking.podbean.com or just search two geeks talking wherever you get your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking